Coming up on the DizPod, we talk about Give Kids the World and Tony Baxter, the Disney table situation issue, possible Magic Kingdom expansions, the overload merch situation in Disney parks, that and more coming up on the DizPod. I'm the goat of Disney. I eat everything. All right, everybody, it's Corey story time. So kick back, relax, put your feet up, and get ready to listen to this one. We're not just going to report Disney news and just talk about it. I mean, that's already been done a million times. But then again, we do love Disney news. We will talk about some. This is not your grandfather's Disney podcast. So I'm watching this new thing on Netflix. Let's talk about it. So Tammy has me running all over Disney World looking for this new lounge fly. Jillian loves China so much that if she was ever lost, she would need a tag on her shirt that says, if lost, return me to China. Jacob's my dude. Jacob is my tech man. He makes me sound good. Hello and welcome once again to the Diz Pod, episode 13. It's like I said before, it's like the NFL weeks. How quickly they fly by. If you're an NFL fan, you know what I mean. And wow, here we are. So let's get right into it. Several things to talk about here. And I have to touch on, oh boy, it's it's a little more than a week ago now. We had the most amazing time at Give Kids the World. So Give Kids the World is an organization that raises money to go to an unbelievable cause. And that cause is to give families. So it's like make a wish in some ways. Uh, But here's the difference. They actually have a home base where kids, sick kids and families can go and have the time of their lives without a penny out of their pockets. And I've known this for many years, seen many, many fundraisers through friends and outlets like this in YouTube. I should say there's nothing like it when you actually step foot on their grounds. When you go there, we parked. So I went for a charity event, and we'll get into that. So we parked out towards a back parking lot, and there were actually golf carts right there waiting to take us to our destination which would be the building where we would live stream a fundraiser. That's how big this place is, like golf carts to to bring you along to your destinations. We chose to walk. I wanted to walk the grounds as we led to the building as we didn't think it was super far to get there to the main building, so we did. And right away, as soon as you get to the first corner, you start to see the magic of this place each and every building now these buildings let's not even call them buildings let's just call them single family homes because that's what it was it was literally a quiet neighborhood of single family homes each one painted in bright colors none to match the next, at least close by. So they were all kind of original. And instead of like, say, a for sale sign or an election sign out front facing the street, they had a sign, but it had the family's name on it. And how special is that to pull in to this vacation destination, maybe something that you never would have done otherwise because, let's face it, medical costs are crazy. And not everybody has the kind of insurance where everything gets paid for. So that was the first impression. There was a small lake across the street 
uh, to where uh, as to where we were walking and it just kept going it just kept winding and I was just soaking it all in it had me already because I know how great the organization is so the other parts of the grounds they actually have an amusement park and they actually have a water area, you know, big, I hate to call it a splash zone because it's bigger than that. You know, when you go to a resort or a water park and they'll have like this big bucket that fills up and it dumps and kids run around and water is coming out of every possible place it can. They had that. There's a place where they can go and have ice cream for breakfast, lunch dinner, any of that. So it paints the picture for you. They they can do so much here, and the families don't even have to leave. I absolutely love this place and looking forward to doing more in the future with them just by simply going there and just seeing what, what they do and how it affects people. We saw families out on the porch, and you just... You know, you feel for them, but you're also happy for them that they're able to experience this part. So I'm in the medical field, and I help people. Uh, physical therapy is my main area of what I do. And sometimes people say, how do you help a person that is so disabled? Guess what? I have a different mindset when I approach these things, even when I've approached children in the rehabilitation realm, if I see a kid in a wheelchair or a young adult in a wheelchair, uh, you know, they have braces on their legs and they get up and, and the way they walk is is very sad for people. You know, when you see this, you feel for the people. I don't, I do. I feel all that, but I put all that aside when I approach it. My focus is I'm here to help this person. I'm on their team, and let's go. It's all the positivity. You know, I don't feel badly for them in the moment. It's let's see what we can do. Let's maximize our time together and see what I can do for you and what we can do together. So that's the kind of mindset I've been used to going into for almost three decades. So why we were there? We were there to raise money in live stream, and the event was we got to sit in and listen to a very intimate panel with Tony Baxter. Who's Tony Baxter? Tony Baxter is a legendary Imagineer for Disney. So he actually has, when you become a legend, you get your name on a window on Main Street. So... This guy, his biggest claim to fame, I think, arguably you could say Figment, but we were there for Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. That was his first big break with Disney. So he first started out as a ice cream scooper, and he had wonderful stories. I mean, that's why you come to this thing, besides raising the money part, the entertainment piece, you come to this to listen to stories you may never hear anywhere else. And he was an ice cream scooper in Disneyland. His first encounter with Walt Walt Disney was Walt was going around and talking to all the cast members and he said Walt approached him and and of course I'm going to paraphrase because my memory isn't the greatest in when recalling things like this but you know all of a sudden I feel like he he kind of froze up a little bit and Walt says Tony, nice to meet you. You know, how are things going? And he think he said, just fine, Mr. Disney. And there was some pause, and Walt kind of paused as well and looked around and said, well then there, carry on. Keep up the good work. <laughs> and that's it. Can you imagine your moment? And that was, that's what happens. I've made sure that that doesn't happen or has never happened for me. I have certainly met my share of celebrities over my lifetime. I've met quite a bit. And I just learned early on, and it was probably from my radio training where I was around. It was a short radio career. 
But I was around celebrities all the time. And then the other area where I was around celebrities was I lived near the Patriots, New England Patriots, practice facility. And being near there, you could just go over to practice in the summer anytime you wanted. So I was right there with one little rope separating me from Tom Brady and crew, you know, running goal line drills right there and falling at your feet, the ball falling at your feet. So, and I just, I just know how to be around celebrities. You just talk to them like, like I'm talking to you and it's the best way to have a normal conversation if you even have that much time with them. So I really, I mean, if, if I could take one thing back, and I don't regret one second of this, and a lot of people know about this story. Last year when I was in the water in Hawaii in, at the Alani Resort, there was no one else in the water for a long distance between me, or I should say properly, Katy Perry and me. And all I said was, you having a good time? <laughs> and she said, uh, yeah, I guess. You know, I should have tried to engage a little bit more right there, but I didn't want to be overbearing. So it is what it is. Like, I don't regret it, but I probably could have had a little more conversation with her at that time. So moving on to the more of the event, Tony Baxter, we, we focused on Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, and he just had some great stories about Big Thunder and, you know, he was like 16, 17 and, and was given a shot. He designed this thing. It was it was tabled for a little while. Be, well, I think they wanted to see some models. You know, he made some sketches and they said, well, let's see some models. That's like the next step in looking to see if something is viable, if something will work in a Disney park. So we put a lot of work into these models. And then the space program happened here at Walt Disney World area, which is Kennedy Space Center. And then, if I get this right, they were supposed to build Space Mountain in Disneyland first. But they ended up putting Space Mountain in Disney World because... And this was one of Walt's babies. I think it was his last design. And they figured, listen, everyone is coming here to see the rockets. The space program has begun. People are coming to Florida to see the rockets take off. Why don't we lure them over here to Walt Disney World where they'll want to do Space Mountain? So Space Mountain happened here first over Disneyland. Then it became time where they said, well, we, we need to get going on some more projects here. Frontierland in Disneyland only has, like, donkeys. And I think country bears? Country bears and you can ride donkeys. They needed something else for Frontierland. So they said, let's dig out this thing that this kid did. And they dug it out. And just skipping ahead, the rest is history. It becomes... Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, and then I think within a year and a half, it came to Walt Disney World. A couple other points I was thinking of is Walt Disney World and Disneyland are flip-flopped. You're going to hear a wonderful, we're in the garage again this morning recording, so there goes like a wonderful loud car, whatever. And so... Where was I? So if you compare the two lands, frontier lands on the West Coast and the East Coast, it's in reverse. Think of Big Thunder as the central piece. And then if I'm looking straight at Big Thunder to my left here at Walt Disney World in Orlando, Splash Mountain, or former now Splash Mountain, would be to your left. Haunted Mansion is to your right of Big Thunder. It's just flip-flopped in Disneyland. So I haven't been there, but it would, I'm sure it'll be a little bit of a mind blow to stand there and look at that and be like, whoa, so weird. 
So weird. So the, the night was phenomenal. Just the stories continued on and on. And the next day he talked about Figment because he was a big hand in creating Figment. He did dump on the current state of the Figment ride. Uh, he said it's it's just not identifiable for children anymore. It's It's not making lifetime memories for children. And Figment was the first character, I guess. When he said this, I was like, I don't know about that. But I'm just going to tell you how he said it. Because I'm, I find it hard to believe Figment was the first character to do meet and greets. But maybe. I can't imagine Mickey and Minnie and other characters not doing meet and greets in Magic Kingdom. You can always email us at livingandiz at gmail.com and let us know if meet and greets just didn't happen until Figment became a thing. But that's what I thought I heard. Could be totally wrong on that. I think I'm wrong on that. That's how I heard it. And now Figman doesn't do any meet and greets, but there was recent news that said a Figman meet and greet is coming back. So let's hope that that happens. That'll be pretty cool. That's like something I never thought would happen. You know, so that could be a good thing. So the other lap, they did an auction. I looked at the auction stuff. I felt like I, felt like I had to give money uh, while we were there. I wanted to, you know, in, in in the great want to do it, I felt like I had to. Like, I'm not leaving till I give money. So Tammy and I ended up buying some t-shirts and a little bit of merch. To, and that's the way we decided to donate. I looked at the items for bid. And they're items for bid. So you don't nitpick too much. But you want to get, you want to pick something that you would enjoy as well. And the one thing I would enjoy... This is like one of the first auctions I've been to. So this is how unexperienced or inexperienced I am. There was this beautiful Epcot plate painted, you know. And Neil comes over, talks about it with his wife, Alyssa. And they end up bidding on it 50 bucks. They throw down the first bid. And I was going to throw down a bid too. And I felt like, oh, I'll throw down a $75 bid. Thinking maybe no one else will put a bid down for it. I think it went for $500. So I, I wouldn't have ended up walking away with anything anyway. I was trying to come up with a way that people watching our stream could bid and we could somehow, you know, transfer the money, but I just couldn't think of any viable way to do that. So we bought merch and felt good about it. I spoke with the lead of public relations over there because she, I recognized her from another Disney YouTube outlet and spoke with her and just told her that, you know, I, I admired her opinions that I've seen on this other outlet and I thought that she was really good and it was good to see her in a new position and she was happy, very, very happy where she is now at Give Kids the World and we just, we talked for a little bit, just kind of what we're both up to and this and that. And she offered, she says, why don't I get you on the our media list? And I was like, she's like, is that okay? I'm like, that's more than okay. I would love to do some events here for Give Kids the World and be involved in raising more money. So that's our first dip into the media realm. And people ask me, you know, would you like to be Disney media? And I would. I would. It. I don't wake up every day frustrated that I'm not. If it happens, cool. If it never happens, so what? I do think that we should be because I think that I have a professional way about me. I think that's how I run my channel. I think that's how I run the podcast. And I think I would just represent Disney in a very good light. And more important than all of that, a chance to share with my Diz family, our viewers on YouTube, first looks at things. I would love to do that with them because they are so special. You're all so special to us. And that would be the main reason why we would want to do that. Each and every week I always talk about sending us some email, letting us know what you want to talk about. And one thing I got from Julia Frankenwitz, I hope I said that right. I'm going off the top of my head. Julia, we love you. And she's probably listening on her patio 
right now. So hello. She wanted me to talk about the table situation and what we're talking about at Disney, which is observed and probably some of this is expected, but some of it is also unacceptable, is you got to go back to what Walt always wanted and he always wanted spick and span cleanliness throughout the park really think about it how often do you see a piece of trash on the grounds of disney right so that's one thing i think that still is maintained well but to have areas where i'll just skip over to like overloaded trash cans now it does probably all boil down to just disney doesn't have enough help and this is a zero percent stab at cast members we love them we've been through this not going there but just maybe the management of each area making sure this is the unex this no this is the unacceptable thing there should be a cast member at all areas where there are tables overwatching when people get up and leave to pounce on that table and wipe that table down. Now, I think most of you that listen to these, these podcasts um, really like me and, and support what I have to say. And because you like me or love me, you don't have to support everything. You can always oppose me. That's kind of why we do this podcast to be a little sharper on things and speak out a little bit more than we do on the live streams. But this is an unacceptable thing. It really is because I'm going to say, more often than not, I am eating at a dirty table at Disney. We've got to clean these tables up. And Disney listens. And I just maybe might bring this one to the live stream. Maybe every time I, you know, in recent weeks, maybe every time I go to a table and it's dirty, I might just say it in, in a nice way, as nice as possible, and just say, Disney, if you're listening, just to really point out, you know, and I can say something like, I'm hearing feedback from guests that we need to be on these tables a little bit more and clean them more, and it's almost 100% of the time. I'm thinking of you jet over to Epcot, as much, mu as much food as we buy and we try and we eat at Disney to review, most tables are filthy. And we kind of, it's gross, but we, we make do with it. I'll put down napkins if it's that bad. Or you'll pick an area of the table that you can salvage. So that's a problem. And it probably boils down to help, but... Even if you can't designate a cast member to watch over an area at all times, have a rotating shift or something if you can. It's Disney. You can figure something out. We need to get these tables cleaner and more consistent. Now, the other thing about tables is the saving of tables. I know there's a mix there of demographics or where we're coming from in the parks. We've got vacationers. And you have annual pass holders. So what you're looking at, and I'm, I, my mind immediately goes to an area like Casey's Hot Dogs. You've got tables out there, and you've got tables across the way as well. And let me think of some other areas. You could be thinking of not so much connections cafe um, and eatery there's always been places to eat there but let's just go with that and without me being able to think of other things off the top of my head other areas and there are many of them and it's when people are just sitting at a table now this is what julia wanted me to talk about we have to analyze this because there are, and my wife and I were looking for a table the other day, and the frustration came where we have a tray with food on it. And it appears like some people have long been done eating and they're just hanging out. 
and tying up a table. So maybe they're tourists and they've been going all day and they're tired and they're just taking that moment to rest and relax some more. While we feel for that, I think the solution is when you're done eating, be respectful of the people that still need tables and get up and just go find another place to sit. You can do that. You can find another place with shade or, or something. I think there's ways around it where you don't have to tie up a table. And I know Disney doesn't like to press people for time. And you can even look back at the end of the night at most parks. Disney doesn't really say you got to leave, but cast members will start to form a wall and start coming towards you slowly uh, as you continue to move more towards the exit. So they probably wouldn't want to do something like, hey, there's a 30, you know, for a quick service or something, there's a 30 minute limit to the table, that kind of thing. But you know what I mean? Reality's reality too. And maybe having some signs posted like that could help. Now, I don't see a cast member coming over to a table and say, you know, hey, excuse me, you know, it's a 30 minute limit. But, you know, in a perfect world, that'd be great. But it's just a call out to people to have a little more respect for those who are looking for a table too because maybe a tired family is just hungry and they're looking to sit as well and eat and do their 30, 35 minutes or something. So let's just try not to tie up tables so much because it really does hurt other guests, I guess we could say. So I want to make sure I touched on, on the table situation and yeah, I think I think that says it all about the table, the table thing. If uh, anyone has any more to add to that, be sure to email us at livingindis at gmail dot com. There's been a lot of talk this week, and I do watch Mickey Views lately. I've been watching a little bit more because I'm interested in the whole governor tussle with Disney, which is totally ridiculous. Totally ridiculous. Uh, lots of things I could say about the governor, but I won't. And so what else can we talk about as part of, let's get to the, the brass tacks of it. So I, I think Braden is a young man who, by the way, we first met Braden on day one of our channel. Day one launch of our channel almost five years ago. And uh, we actually hung out for the day and uh, had a good time. And uh, I just think, yeah, I just call him a good boy. I know he's I know he's still a young man, but he's just a good boy. He appears to be a very good boy um, from what we reserve, uh, observed from hanging out with him all day. That day over in Toy Story Land, it was, it was the debut of Toy Story Land. So... He does not bring a lot of things forward if they're not likely to come true. And he just talked about the expansion of Magic Kingdom. So I figured we need to talk about this too. And I feel like I am all for it. And I have a podcast, several podcasts ago, where I talk about it's time to embrace change. We hang on to rides. There's always going to be a group that never wants a certain ride to go because it means so much to them. It's nostalgic, things like that. Now, I agree that there are, I feel there are some rides that should never leave. They are staples. I feel the other stuff is interchangeable, but again, other people will disagree with me. With that said, in Magic Kingdom, I feel like things that should never go are... Hall of Presidents, Haunted Mansion, Small World, Pirates. I am not so sure about Space Mountain. It's a classic. It's a classic, but I wouldn't be sad if something else replaced it. Other than that, I mean, they could change out everything else. Um, probably keep Big Thunder. I mean, Magic is a classic park. So that doesn't leave that much else to change out. But, so if you look at what's proposed, we know definitely Tiana's 
new ride by you adventure is going in it's currently under construction we've talked about it we've covered it in detail as much detail as we are able to get our hands on and we can't just do that we can't just have this new orleans style ride sitting in the old west so i have to say with 100 percent conviction that disney I feel like transition lands are important to them. And they're not just going to stand by and have this piece sit there like a sore thumb in a place where it looks like it doesn't belong. So I think we do have a lot more theming coming around this ride. I feel like towards the back area, that will all be transformed and Pecos Bills that sits outside of former Splash Mountain, which is a quick serve that serves fajitas and things like that, southwestern things. I think that simply becomes a quick serve for New Orleans-style food. And in the... I feel like when you leave the queue, like for the first time maybe in Disney history, because I'm not thinking of any other place where you can do this, that there'll be a sort of bakery in the sense that you can get beignets off the ride. But you know what? Now that I think of that, I'm going to retract that because there would be a backup of a line so much that would be it would be too congested for the exit part of that ride. So I take that back. I think that Shortly after you exit the building, off in the dis- near near distance, if that makes sense, will be an area where you can get beignets and everything. Maybe sort of like when you enter France and turn the corner and Ratatouille's adventure is straight ahead. To your right, you have crepes and things. I think you're going to have something like that back there. Uh, or they'll put the beignets in the quick serve. Because maybe they'll put a sit-down restaurant more towards the back. That would be cute, quaint, and intimate. I think those are the things that are coming. I'm combining that with what I saw reported on Mickey Views. Partially my view, mostly his. I feel like, and he was also he was mentioning, you know, with the transition, there is land to develop behind Big Thunder. So, he's thinking Coco and Encanto in that order, and then a villain section that will connect with Haunted Mansion because Disney's wanted to connect that for the longest time to take congestion away from the Liberty Square area. So, that's a nice flow. And here's the here's that's that's awesome. It doesn't affect any other attractions, but this is where it might rub some people the wrong way. And I say let it go in Elsa style. Just taking out Frontierland. Just wipe it out. It doesn't make sense to have it anymore. Let's face it, all we do is walk by. That's all we do. We just walk by it. That's it. We just walk by it. We don't stop. We don't really hang out. We don't do it. Stop trying to hang on to that. But again, disclaimer, if that if you love Frontierland, fine. But let's change the outside to New Orleans style, as reported on Mickey Views. Let's change it to New Orleans style, and let's have fun with it. Let's just have fun with it. Pe- people will embrace it. It'll look beautiful. And the elephant in the room is... Tom Sawyer Island. So Disney has slowly removed signage from that area. So you think that they may have been thinking ahead anyway. And there was a cultural sensitivity group that went through all the parks in 2019, pointing out things that may be offensive to people. And Tom Sawyer is offensive to people to some degree. Now, I like Tom Sawyer Island. We've been over there with the kids. It's fun to walk around, but you do it and you're done. And it's never anything that's the main plan 
of most people that set out to go to Magic Kingdom because it's so busy and there's so much hustle and bustle going on. That gets that goes to the back burner. If you can make it to Tom Sawyer Island on a vacation, then God bless you. It's really hard to get over there with everything else you want to get done. I Here's my idea. Said by none, I don't think. I think this is an original idea by me, but if it isn't, I don't care. But I'm just saying I feel it like it is because I haven't heard anyone else talk about this. But what about if we wipe out what's on that land and that is where we put Tiana's Place restaurant and maybe some shops in the area. It would be, there's plenty of land to do that. Right centralized Tiana's Place, great lighting in the front. I'm feeling this. This is where it has to go and shops around it. And how do you get over there? It would be too much to boat people back and forth. So what I would do is, oh, can't do that. See, I'm, I'm doing this kind of live while recording. Uh, I was thinking maybe you could build a bridge to get people over back and forth just to walk over and get there. But we wouldn't want to get rid of the Liberty Bell, which is the paddle boat, because that fits right along with New Orleans. We have to keep that. So, okay. Maybe we boat people over still. Yeah, let's do that. Let's keep that. We keep that part. We totally redo, reimagine that island. Oh, man, gives me the chills. Who's on board with me on that? I'm visualizing it now. It would be amazed is. So those are my thoughts on the expansions. Let's let us know what you think of the expansions at livingindiz at gmail.com. Another question that was asked to me, which was a very intelligent question, and I can't remember the name of the viewer that was watching and chatting in the live chat when we were at Toy Story Land the other day, but they asked, what do you think of the overload of merch right now at Disney? And I spoke to my family about it, and it's easy to go back and forth with this one. I think that you would have to actually talk to... Disney officials uh, do research on the economy. Of course, we know the economy is not good. It's in the toilet. But, you know, there's just views about it where may, you know, pe maybe people are really scraping up their pennies to come to Disney because it's their love of Disney. It's their lifetime trip. It's their once every year trip. It's their once every whatever trip that they can't buy the expensive lounge flies and things like that. So when that happens, are we coming up with an overload of merchandise? We have to really think about this. Is Disney over-ordering all of a sudden? Is it the economy and the people coming that just can't spend that extra money right now? Which one is it? And I feel like everything Disney does is calculated. So I don't know at the end of this analysis if I can provide something that I'm definitive on. I think the family was kind of split on, you know, yep, part of it's the economy, but part of it is just overordering. That's a tough one. So if I had a Buzz Lightyear gun to my head, and I had to say, um, I think it is a percentage. I, I feel this at this moment in time. I feel like, I used to feel like Disney liked the hype of putting something on the shelves and watching it sell out. It's kind of like I want, they want to sell it out to create more hype for the next thing. But is that true great marketing? I don't know. You kind of want to have enough for your guests to sell more. We're going to find out maybe in the next festival. Let's look at Food and Wine Festival coming up in July and see if the lounge flies and merch hang around. It feels like the last 
few festivals, lounge flies and things are hanging around. So tough to say, tough to say. Tammy feels like there's an overload of products like lounge flies right now. She's like, there's just too many coming out where she felt like two years ago, three years ago, there was less coming out. But now there is just too much pump being pumped out. So be interesting to see what Disney com- does coming up. I don't really have definitive answers on this. Like I said, if I had a Buzz Lightyear gun to my head, which isn't very accurate because of that stupid red dot where you can't tell where yours and 10 other people's is pointing. That's my frustration about Buzz. Um, <sighs> Disney, like I said, is very calculated. And I really don't know. I really don't know. I think that specifically there's so many lounge flies, the the orange bird ones hanging around, the latest of the 50th lounge flies hanging around. Maybe you put too many 50ths out and people bought them and they're like, that's my limit. And, you know, maybe that transitioned over to this particular. But, but I guess it's hard to hide the fact that Disney – did order a, a ton of these things. And maybe they don't mind sending those to the character warehouse where they'll make their money back on that. So I really don't have a ton of feedback on that. All I can say is what's happening out there. So but this is probably a percentage, though. The percentage, I don't know. You know, maybe it's maybe it's 70%. No, maybe, well, maybe it's 70% Disney overordered and for and 30% people just can't afford it, or 60-40. So I can't come to a conclusion on that one. I, don't, I think you have to have more facts than anything on that. And that's a good transition to the character warehouse. Has the character warehouse lost its flair? I feel like the character warehouse, I think... A couple things since the pandemic, and I actually don't think this has anything to do with JPEG, but I think it has to do with in the beginning coming off the pandemic that Disney was trying to recuperate all the money that they lost. And with that said, pricing used to be a lot better and cheaper with products that left the parks and went to the character warehouse for the public to go and shop at. So if nobody knows what that is, there's two locations at the outlets in Orlando. And basically the, like say the orange bird lounge flight, that thing is going to end up at the character warehouse and where it's selling for like 80 or $85 in the parks right now, it will go for maybe $45, $40, which is, Still a steal, but they were more like $25, I think. Maybe $35. They, they were much cheaper. And overall pricing for everything was much cheaper at the Character Warehouse a few years ago. So that's partially of what uh, stops us from going and shopping and purchasing things from there. Uh, for us, it's a mix, but I think when we look at the merch, we're like, this is really the merch that nobody really wanted. I I don't find that there's a lot that pulls us to go there. I, I feel like it's a lot more of the junky stuff, for lack of better terms. So we haven't been super impressed by the character warehouse. So I feel like it's lost its flair, and the pricing isn't as good. So, and the other thing is, too lately and you know with being hired for the what I say the job I work currently I am I was the raise I received was so much more than I ever thought I would make in my area of business and so it affords us the ability to be able to buy more merch in the parks than we used to So if there's something we like, we're finding it and buying it first before it goes to the character warehouse. And here's another, to my point, the stuff we are buying in the parks that we like, 
isn't really making it to the character warehouse. So for whatever our taste is, it's not mattering to us because we're not buying many things in the parks and then seeing it show up at the character warehouse and, and we're like, oh man, this stinks. We just paid 60 bucks for this and now it's 35 So I think it's lost its flair. You can let us know at livingindiz at gmail.com for sure. And so I think that we have done quite well this week on the podcast. It's late morning on Sunday, and I feel like I gave you some great content to where we won't fall back on our staples. We won't do This Week in Disney this week or the spotlight character spotlight or tap into Disney's Park blog. I think that we will call it a week here on the podcast. And I'm sure we'll be back with all of our favorites. Well, you know, if you have favorite segments of those. And we are going to get Jillian, I believe, on the podcast this upcoming week to talk about a subject that could be a little touchy. But that's what we do here and there on the podcast. I hope you have a wonderful week. And yeah, we'll see you in the parks. I'm Corey, and we'll see you in the parks. If you're about to start planning your next Disney vacation, book it with Your Magical Adventures Await. Claudia is creating Disney Adventures worldwide. She could create a magical adventure to Walt Disney World Florida, any Disney Park worldwide, Disney Cruise Lines, Alani Resort in Hawaii, and guided group vacations with Adventures by Disney. Also, she is a Universal Studios expert. If you book with her, her services are free. Disney pays her to help you create a seamless, magical adventure. Her availability is really unmatched. You can contact her Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 8 p.m., Saturday and Sunday, 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. Make your magical planner, Claudia Anderson, from Your Magical Adventures Await, 956-455-8049. You can also reach her on Instagram, Claudia Anderson all one word. For more details, go to livingindiz.com to check out her ad there. Thinking about wanting to live near Disney? With over a decade of helping people find the home of their dreams, Victor is the perfect realtor of La Rosa Realty Horizons to help you find the home of your dreams. Go to DisneyAtYourDoorstep.com. That's DisneyAtYourDoorstep.com. So if you're interested to moving near the magic, once again, contact Victor Naraki at DisneyAtYourDoorstep.com and let him know that Living in Diz sent you. That'll do it for another week of the Diz Pod. Make sure you check us out on the Swell app. That's S-W-E-L-L. We broadcast and drop five-minute podcasts throughout the week with the most consistent one being the post-live stream walkout from wherever we live streamed during the week. And you can usually count on those within the next 30 minutes of going off the air. And again, we, we drop every Monday, 9 a.m., a full-length podcast right here where you're listening to and we hope you continue to follow and enjoy if you want to contribute in any way you can do that with right on spotify with ad free sponsorship you can also check us out over at youtube our channel living in diz and in the description of any video there go to the live streams and the replays and click on those and you will find links for becoming a Diz Club member and also becoming a Patreon. There's so much to see over there. Check out our website, livingindiz.com. So many great things going on over there. You want to check that out. All you want and need to know about the members of the channel. You can sign up for our email list there so you're alerted anytime we have news. 
with an extended schedule of our live streams. It's a three live stream lineup. Those are typically updated every single Saturday's morning. And please send us some questions. We'd love to read them on the air here at livinginDiz at gmail.com. For Mushu, Jacob, Jillian, Tammy, I'm Corey from Living in Diz. Thank you so much for being dedicated to our family, our channel, our podcast. Thank you so much for allowing us to be your ticket to Disney. And we'll see you in the parks.